it's always great to see a release of an exhibition on screen film um, in Australian cinemas. And it's the 10th anniversary as well of uh, exhibition on screen. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to Phil Grabsky, who I've spoken to a number of times, who has directed the latest uh, film, Hopper, An American Love Story, all about Edward Hopper, the American artist. Phil, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thank you. Always, always a pleasure. <laughs> Great to talk to you. Now, what was it that attracted you to uh, the paintings and the work and life of Edward Hopper? Well, since we started Exhibition on Screen about 11 years ago, I mean, it's always been my ambition to be as broad as possible, historically, geographically, female artist, male artist, whatever. Um, and, you know, there are just certain names that you are drawn to because you want to know more about them. Some of those are actually the biggest names of all, Monet, Vermeer, Leonardo and some are maybe a little bit less well known. Hopper is a very interesting artist because there are plenty of people who simply don't know his name. But as soon as you show people an image like Nighthawks, they're mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, I know that. Um, for me, uh, I wanted to find out more about what these pictures were really about because they're somehow unresolved, they're mysterious. The more you look at them, the more angles and details and drama and story there is to them. And you're also, you have to create your own story a little bit, which is very interesting. And I wanted to know who, who was the artist behind these paintings? The little I knew of Edward Hopper was fairly, how would I put it? Uh, wasn't terribly detailed. It kind of presented him as a monosyllabic, recalcitrant, difficult man, unpleasant to his wife, never spoke, never gave interviews, you know, so I thought I'm taking on a challenge here. Luckily, of course, what I discovered was something, and this is often the case, far more complex, far more broad, um, a mix of, of, yes, he was difficult at times, other times he was warm and funny, but above all, what an extraordinary artist. I mean, I've just come from a screening in New York where I've been watching it on a big screen. I mean, he, he, he is staggering as an artist, staggeringly good. I absolutely agree. I mean, seeing Nighthawk uh, Hawks and, uh, and some of his other paintings uh, in your film, it's, uh, it, it is quite incredible. And uh, he, he does have a, a really interesting history um, which you delve into and find so much information, um, including, I must uh, commend you, on a, a couple of archival uh, bits of film footage with him in it, which is incredible. I sat down with a colleague and I said, what we're going to do is we're going to transcribe every word that we can find <laughs> of Edward Hopper. So... If he, if, he, if he wrote an article, if he talked on the radio, if he gave a television interview, and there isn't much, what there is is fabulous. When he spoke, he was very articulate, and what's nice for the film, he could be quite funny too. But footage, I mean, this is a guy who's one of the most successful popular artists in America of the first two thirds of the 20th century, and there's no, there's no televised interviews with him, except the two that we found. Mm. One in black and white, one in colour. Uh, I would be fascinated if anyone else has any others, but those were the two, only two that we could find. Uh, it's not complicated, it's not uncomplicated finding them, and then you've got to get them, uh, you know, um, clean them up and so forth. But they're very, very re revealing. He simply wasn't interested. He is an artist who just wanted to be to paint, to be left alone. Sometimes that meant that he was unpleasant to his wife because he shut her out. Um, after a certain point, actually pretty early, once he started being successful, then he, he didn't really feel the need to market anymore because he knew his paintings would sell. He wasn't an extravagant man. He had enough money to live. 
he just wanted to paint. He didn't. And the other aspect of it was that it's interesting. Somebody the other day said to me, uh, an interview for a British newspaper said, um, do you like Edward Hopper? And I, and I was slightly taken aback and I said, well, the film tells you what I think of Edward Hopper. But it's more complicated than that. Mm. And I think it's the same for him with paintings. If somebody said, what does the painting mean? He said, well, you have to look at the painting tells you what it means. I can't summarize it in a sentence. It's more complex than that. So tremendous biography. What we did found in terms of the, the archive and his, his words and we'll come on to, I'm sure, his wife's words, because she kept extensive diaries, mm. is utterly fascinating. And I kind of defy anybody actually to to watch this film and look at his works, whether it's the drawings, the etchings, the watercolors, or the famous oil paintings, and not come away thinking this this really was a you know he he really was a great artist. Definitely, looking at, at those paintings, they are, they are quite superb. But it, it's so interesting the way he, he viewed the world, especially in America. Which uh, and uh, and some of your curators and uh, and experts comment on this that uh, it was almost as if he saw the world in a very distinctive way, in, certainly in America, um, which didn't have uh, issues of race or, or issues um, related yeah. to that. It was a very uh, a very white world in many respects. So he 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 had a very you know what can I say a very narrow view, but also yeah. a very uh, interesting view. I think it's important when we make these films, they're not hagiographies. Mm. I, I start with a, I, I, I look to find out who this person is and to present it in as fair and honest way as I possibly could. Mm. Um, rarely have I dealt with an artist who I really disliked or worse, actually, you know, I mean, I would, I would find it very hard, for example, to make a film about a, um, an anti-Semite or a racist or something like that. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think um, Hopper was racist, except that his his subject matter is resolutely white. Mm. He only paints a a um, non-white once. Mm. There's one in an illust there's another one in an illustration. Um, it just wasn't his world. It's outside. It's in New York. You can look out the window. I mean, it's my father grew up in New York at the same time. This is a very mixed community. That just wasn't his concern. There is also an element to it of of just for him. He, he he's constantly exploring and and uh, light, and I think that there is you know he his use of white and and. Um, you know, he, he says in the film, doesn't he, that if he could just paint sunlight, that would make him happiest. There's an, a, there's an element of that, too. Um, he was somebody. It's funny. I once did a photo photography course and 12 of us were taken down to a beach, very geographically interesting beach. And we were all told you've got two hours. And what we're going to look at later is your best photograph. And everyone looked in one direction and I turn 180 to look at the in the other direction. I think Hopper was a bit like that. We know in Gloucester, when he went to this important port um, in New England, everyone's down painting the boats in the harbour, the beach, the, the waves. He paints the houses. Mm. But there's an element of him where what he's doing is he's looking at the, the everyday, the things we might miss. Um, so, you know, some photographers take wonderful photographs of sunsets. He wouldn't do that. He would probably photograph a trash can or something. I mean, he's, he's just looking, he's suggesting we look around us and find the interest and the beauty of the day to day. And whilst he's doing that, when he's out sketching, he kind of wants to be surrounded by a bubble, which means he doesn't want to hear the noise and the people and for him, it's about architecture and light striking architecture. Um, he's like a filmmaker in some ways who, who's offering you a single frame. So you know something's happened beforehand. You know something's going to happen, but you're not quite sure what. And you've just got this single frame and it might be a single person caught in a window, a single look. I mean, his storytelling is, is fantastic. 
but you have to engage with it as a viewer to tease out what you think is happening. He's not, he's, he doesn't offer it to you on a plate. Mm. And I think that's deliberate. I think he's deliberately trying to make you, the viewer, be part of this three-way conversation between him, the canvas, and you. Exactly. Uh, and, and that's what I found so fascinating. Uh, as always in your documentaries, and, and it's always so impressive, you uh, you you use voiceover to uh, illustrate uh, letters and, uh, as you say, his wife's uh, uh, journals, etc., on uh, her observations, um, and uh, so much about his influences, his uh, visit to Paris, um, uh, etc., and, uh, of course, the music that uh, illustrates the film, that that really um, heightens, I suppose, the mood of the film. So all of these elements are just so well put together, as always, uh, in uh, this film about Hopper. You know, I mean, it, it, it's almost more important than ever that what we present to you in the cinema is cinematic. Mm. It's entertaining as well as educational. You know, COVID has been a... a it's, it's way too early to forget the impact of COVID. Plenty of people, um, myself included, have, have uh, had people that have you know, been affected by COVID or lost, lost friends, family, whatever, to COVID. And obviously COVID had a real impact on the cinema. So when I'm now making, you know, even more than ever, the cinema films that we present to you have to be, really have to reward you for making the effort of going to the cinema. Which means they, you know, we, we we really work hard on the dramatic side of the biography. But that's great with great with Hopper because the words of Hopper, the words of his wife. There's no narration in this film because I didn't need it. Mm. I've got the world's experts who give me their sound bites, and I've got the words beautifully read. Thank you for saying that beautifully read, um, and then some of the archive. So you. The other thing, of course, is when you study his paintings, which is great for me as a filmmaker. I wasn't aware of this, really, when I started. To a large degree, his biography, his relationship with Joe, his wife, is played out in these paintings. You, you, you can get some pleasure from the paintings if you know nothing about Edward and Joe Hopper, but when you understand their biography, which is what the film tells you about, which is very dramatic, then you start to understand the paintings because for example, every single woman in those paintings is her. Sometimes he changes the face, sometimes he accentuates different parts of the body. But she models for everything. Um, sometimes it's clear that it's the two of them in the, in the picture. Um, Nighthawks, for example, there's three men and one woman in that painting. She's the woman. And it's been suggested that the guy who's who's got his back to you, that's Hopper, Edward Hopper. So. He's in the paintings. Um, the, the score is absolutely critical to a film like this. I mean, it is to any film, um, but I have a most fantastic composer called Simon Farmer. And, you know, he worked with a, uh, um, I said to him, Don't, we're not gonna do jazz. One, because it's too obvious. New York, 30s jazz, not a good choice. Two, it's not Edward Hopper's world. He's not, he didn't listen to jazz. But I said, I do want a sense of a wind instrument. So he brought in a clarinetist who was just fantastic. Anyway, then I, the, the score is, is very moving, um, absolutely works. Um, so the whole thing is, is I mean, I've just, as I say, I've just come from this screening where the, the audience really, really enjoyed it. So they come away having enjoyed this, this volatile relationship but ultimately a love story and they also come away with a much greater understanding of a great artist um so that's you know it's kind of kind of a win-win exactly <laughs> it's also great to see the way you choose which paintings and illustrations um that are a part of the film and uh, so let's talk about that at your your uh, decision making there and also is there a permanent exhibition at uh, the Whitney Museum of Modern Art? Well I mean uh, in about five to eight minutes I'm going off to the opening of the I'm in New York I'm going to the opening of the show it is pure coincidence um, that the Whitney are opening a major show called Ed, uh, Hopper's New York 
um, at the, in the same week that we're releasing our film. I, ca I first spoke to the Whitney about four years ago and they said, we've just had a lot of new materials bequested to us uh, and we're thinking of doing an exhibition, but we don't know when. Um, they were very helpful with us as we were producing the film and I filmed the director, I filmed the curator of this exhibition we filmed at the Whitney um, and plenty of the images that we've secured, we either had to get their permission or they gave us high resolution images. Anyway, um, but it's just coincidence. And uh, I, 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 they're obviously a much bigger institution than me, but I think it works for both of us. I just had a very nice article in the British Guardian newspaper, which makes reference to the fact this exhibition is opening. So there's some cross marketing going on. Um, these things are complementary. When we make films about big exhibitions, you know, there's things that we can do that an exhibition struggles to, particularly in terms of showing the locations, music, making more of the biography. And of course, in a gallery, they can show more paintings because one of the issues for me is what do you leave out? Mm. You know, particularly early in his career, he was quite prolific. He did a lot of illustrate, illustrative magazine covers and they're brilliant, but I can't show more than three or four. Paris, he, he does a lot of watercolors in Paris. They're really good. I could only show four, five, or six. So, and then you've got, he's one of those artists, um, and there are, he's not alone in this, but there's, there's just so many masterpieces, you know, classics, ones that people know, and you can't include them all. The, you know, when you come to a new painting, it's got to be driving the story forwards. As I say, luckily in this case, because they are biographical to some extent, it does drive the story forwards. Um, Ultimately, what I'm always trying to do, as you know, Peter, is just encourage people to look. We're all rushing around and we're not looking. We don't, we don't taste the food that we eat. We don't look out the train window because we're on our phone. We barely look at our partners. What I'm trying to do is just slow it down a little bit and just look at these remarkable paintings and you'll, you'll get so much from it. Um, and you'll learn about his world, his art, his relationships. Um, so there may be one or two paintings that you... Uh, there probably aren't that many paintings that aren't in there, actually. We, you know, we, we actually went a little bit longer. We went to 93 minutes rather than our normal 90. Um, there's plenty of, I mean, I'd be surprised if there's a painting that people really hold dear to them that isn't in the film, actually. And there'll be plenty that they didn't know before. Exactly. And, and uh, that's what's so great about your films, the discovery uh, aspect uh, and seeing them on the big screen in cinemas. So uh, considering it's, uh, you said 11 years, but um, 10th anniversary, etc., of uh, exhibition on screen. And uh, it, it, it's so remarkable that uh, you've forged this really fascinating approach to telling stories about artists on screen um, that, that audiences really love. You know, there's a, a, I recently took a few days off and I went, somebody invited me to cycle up a French mountain. And I just said, sure. I didn't really know how high this mountain was. It's called Mont Ventoux in uh, Southern France. It's actually on the Tour de France route. And when I turned up, they said, oh, by the way, there's a special challenge that we're gonna try, which is you don't go up once, you go up three times in a day. <laughs> Seriously, it's like four and a half thousand meters of climbing. The point I'm making is you, 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 you set your mind to it and you say, I'm going to, I'm going to do that today. I'm going to, unless my body completely fails me one foot after the other, I'm just going to get up there, come down and go back up. Same with exhibition on screen. We are always in production. We've had plenty of, of hurdles, obstacles. <clears throat> um, COVID has really hurt us. Cinemas closed, audiences stayed away. Um, you know, we were doing okay in Australia, but it's obviously uh, now we're hoping to, you know, we have to rebuild again. But I love making the films. Those those people that go to see the films really, really enjoy them. Mm. I mean, uh, the reaction to the films is always fantastic. Um, our challenge, and of course you're helping with this, our challenge is making people aware that they're in the cinemas. And of course the challenge with event cinema like opera, like theatre, and of course they have big marketing budgets, which I don't, is that these films are only in the cinema for two, three, four, five, six times. 
it's not like the old days where you'd have a week, 28 screenings in that week. And if it did well, they just extend it another week. And my, my Mozart and Beethoven films were booked for actually for two weeks. And I ended up playing in those cinemas for six months because they just extend and extend. See, that doesn't happen with event cinema. Uh, and part, partly it doesn't happen because there's so many films now. Um, so we need people, and again, thank you for your help in this. We need people to be aware of the films. Um, I don't think that anyone would be disappointed, young and old, male, female, artist or non-artist, whatever. I genuinely think this is a, a you know, really exciting, mm. powerful film, um, which will encourage you to go home and sketch or draw or look at art afresh or with a bit more care, um, understand more about the United States. I mean, it's called an American love story deliberately, of course, and it has a slightly ambivalent meaning to it. It's about their relationship. And it is a, it's a, you know, it's one of those really important relationships of the 20th century, Joe and Edward Hopper. But it's also his love of the day to day of America around him. No, you won't see references too much to the Great Depression or the Second World War or Kennedy's assassination. But you'll see another side of America that he focuses on um, a shop window, a door window, a hydrant or, you know, he used to take the, what is now the high line, but was an elevated railway and just see somebody in a window, you know, uh, with their back to the window or sitting on a bed or at a desk. And that's what he would paint. Um, fantastic slices of real life. Um, so yeah, tremendous, tremendously, uh, I mean, it was tough to make. We had three shoots in America during COVID. That wasn't easy, but um, I'm really very happy with the film. Well, congratulations on it. It's absolutely fascinating. I learned a great deal. I didn't know much about Edward Hopper at all. So uh, now I feel as if uh, I have been given a, a really solid lesson <laughs> about and he, Edward Hopper. You know, and he's, he's so cinematic. I mean, he's influenced. Yes. We don't really, we decided not to get into this, but we could have looked at after he dies, the impact he's had on filmmakers has been huge. I mean, we make passing reference to Hitchcock. Yeah. Really easy example is the house in Psycho mm. is a direct copy, which Hitchcock acknowledged of a painting by Edward Hopper. Mm. Um, there was a transition in Hopper's life from him going to the cinema a lot and being very influenced by cinema to, to him influencing cinema. Vim Vendors. I mean, there's plenty of filmmakers who who are open about their the, the influence that Hopper has had, because he's a master storyteller, whilst not giving you everything, and he's very cinematic. Um, beautiful light, light. You know, I mean, uh, tremendous. I mean, you, if you have any interest in art, you've got to be interested in Edward Hopper. Mm. Well, there's even a painting set in a cinema which I found yeah. fascinating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Look, congratulations on that, Phil. And I must ask you, what's coming up for exhibition on screen? So, I mean, our, our the 10th season, anniversary season, and um, we've got a, a Cezanne, big Cezanne film. It's actually one of my most popular ever films, which is uh, based on a big exhibition that went from Paris to London to Washington. I definitely finished that film. I directed it, finished that film thinking he is, he, he, I got asked this today, who's my favorite artist. Certainly when I finished the Cezanne film, I would have said Cezanne, I'm just unbelievable. Then we're making a film about an artist that's been rather overlooked called Mary Cassatt, but a very important impressionist artist. She was working with Monet and Renoir and Degas. And, and I think that a kind of male weighted art history community has slightly put a you know not given her the, the the due that she deserves so we seek to rebalance that very interesting artist an american but she lived she went to paris and lived um, almost all of her life in paris very fine artist um we worked very closely with the national gallery of art in washington on that then biggie i've got exclusive access to the biggest vermeer exhibition ever going to be held at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam and that's going to be quite a pure exhibition on screen we're going in to film the exhibition with the curator with the director with some other colleagues of the curator for those which is most people who can't get to it 
this is going to be the next best thing. Mm. And even and they say they've never had an exhibition this big, and they say it'll never happen again. A bit like the Leonardo that um, I filmed, but the very first exhibition on screen was the biggest Leonardo ever. That'll never be repeated either. Finally, getting a bit closer to you geographically, uh, Tokyo Stories, based on an exhibition in Britain, um, but it's the history of Tokyo through its artists. Really interesting. Beautiful historic artworks, as well as very contemporary artists, photographers. Um, and the only reason we haven't finished that is because we haven't been able to get into Japan. Those rules have just relaxed, literally this week, I think. Um, so that will be ready for next summer. Ne well, up as well, next May. So busy. And then, of course, we're already thinking of season 11. <laughs> Well, it's great to hear that the upcoming films sound terrific, uh, as always, and uh, and certainly from October twentieth, uh, people should go to cinemas across Australia and see uh, Hopper, an American love story, uh, all about Edward Hopper, the artist. Uh, and we've been speaking to the director Phil Grabsky. As always, good to talk to you, Phil. Thanks so much. Very good. My very last thing is just to remind your audience at seventh-art.com. You can keep up to date. You can see clips of past movies. You can download and stream the past movies. Um, our Afghan film, which just won the BAFTA, um, the best single documentary, 20 years in Afghanistan. You can download and stream it. Um, so it's well worth a visit. Sounds terrific. Phil, as always, thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye.